morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, call and response. I like it. Um, before I get started, I just want to thank all of the organizers, the board, the hosts, all of you. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful book festival. I feel great synergy and pride and honor to be here. Um, Dick, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, this book, The Circuit, um, you know, Dick and I were talking, Dick is also a wonderful craftsman of words, and I was talking about how what I was aspiring to do was write a quartet, right? This is my four seasons. Um, you don't just find it in Vivaldi uh, and Eliot, but you can also find it in something as visceral um, and um, entertaining as sports, tennis in particular. So, um, Thanks for letting me take these stories out for a walk in the sun of a lovely Saturday. And away we go. The 2017 Wimbledon Championships began on the 3rd of July. The day prior, the President of the United States sent out via Twitter an, an edited video image of himself delivering a staged beating a former wrestling executive, Vince McMahon, on the outskirts of a ring with the logo of the cable news network CNN superimposed over where McMahon's head belonged. And the then governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie, was photographed in a bathing suit, baseball cap, and t-shirt enjoying a lovely summer Sunday with his family on the beach of a state park that, like all of them, he had shut down due to a budget impasse. Independence Day in America was a day away. And luckily, I was far away. I turned on the television set. I was in the mountains not far from towns with names like Lanao the Gaia, Mas Lorenz, Salamo, and Tamarit, where all the vertigo-inducing winding roads lead downhill, first to Torre de Mbarra and on to Tarragona another summer in Catalonia, north of Barcelona, south of Barcelona, a few scattered weeks of Barcelona in between. Here is where year after year Wimbledon happens for me. This also means that my Wimbledon has been seen through the lens of this place, my second home, for a good chunk of my life. For instance, every year during the 13 days of the tournament, some 150,000 servings of the fabled fresh strawberries from Kent County, England, partnered with generous helpings of sweet clotted cream, are consumed on the Wimbledon grounds. It's as iconic as Cracker Jacks and hot dogs at a baseball game, and mint juleps at Churchill Downs. And every year, the Spanish television network goes through the trouble of having a correspondent who is covering the tournament try the dish live on the air just to point out that the strawberries, though good, can't hold a candle to the strawberries grown in Huelva, where 96% of the 250,000 tons of strawberries produced annually in Spain are grown, making it the second largest source of strawberries in the world, as well as the biggest exporter of them on the planet. You can imagine what being here for the 2008 Wimbledon final was like. Often referred to as the greatest tennis match of all time, though I'm not buying it. Apologies to my friend John Wertheim, I'm not buying it. This final was the moment when the Federer-Nadal rivalry became something greater than a rivalry. It became a notch on the cultural timeline. It played out over four hours and 48 minutes, 6-4, 6-4, 6-7, in the tiebreak, 6 7, 8 10 in the tiebreak, 9 7, extending so late into the day that a visible darkness descended ominously over center court. The points played long, with Rafa constantly escaping near death situations by retrieving balls that looked certain to get past him and using his lefty spin serve in do or die moments to live to see another point. I'll never forget the numerous, varied, 
and unreserved nervous breakdowns of the Spanish broadcasting team, who, unlike their American and English counterparts, never bother with any silly charade of impartiality when it comes to important matters such as these. After having lost two straight Wimbledon finals to Roger Federer, Rafael Nadal, known as Rafa, won and in the process broke a string of five straight titles at the tournament for Federer. It seemed at the time like one of those self-contained victories, a bauble, a blip, a skip of the record. Nadal showed the world that he was much more than a clay court specialist and in defeating Federer at his most cherished venue, that he was more than a muscle shirt wearing impediment to Federer's historical legacy. He was that afternoon at Wimbledon a harbinger of change. For although Federer would take the title back the following year and win it again in 2012, all of the other Wimbledons from 2008 to 2016 were won by Nadal, Novak Djokovic, or Andy Murray. Players who are variations on a theme of a similar style, far removed from the classic serve and volley tactics that are the roots from which both Federer and Wimbledon itself have flourished. The sea change after Nadal's 2008 win was so sudden, strong, and convincing that Federer's 2012 Wimbledon victory, a mere four years later, was generally greeted with surprise. When the 2017 tennis season started, the aftershacks of Nadal's intervention in 2008 were still being felt on the Wimbledon grass. Nadal himself couldn't sustain the brief success he had enjoyed on the surface, but both Djokovic and Murray continued to carry the torch there for the defensive baseliners. Despite game resistance from Federer in 2014 and 2015 Wimbledon finals, Djokovic's wins felt like a fait accompli, as did Murray's 2016 title against big serving Milo Sharonic, who's playing today in Stuttgart, by the way. In Rafa's absence, the Spanish broadcasts focus on strategy and technique. They intone on the history of head-to-head -head matchups, recent performances, and how these may affect a player's psychology at a high or low moment in the match. The forehand is the right, or for the English, the drive, whether you use your right or left, whether you're conservative or liberal. And the backhand is the other side, and the same word for setback, misfortune, or hitch. As early as 2004, you'd hear the intrepid suggestion that a player who could repeatedly successfully attack Federer's backhand would be able to knock him off his perch. The story behind Federer's return to dominance in 2017 was his ability and, it has to be said, his willingness to finally figure that out. Summer, 2017, half the year gone, and where were we? Federer sweeping away all before him on the hard court swing of the first quarter of the circuit, Nadal not far behind. Then, during the second quarter of the year, the clay court swing, Federer takes a pass and Nadal does the same. Except for Rome where he lost in the quarters to one emergent talent, the powerful Dominic team, and saw young Sasha Zverev beat Djokovic in the final to become the youngest player since Djokovic to win a Masters 1000 title. Was it Zverev's time now? Were the young legs of the tour gaining strength as the circuit approached summer? Was winter and spring's fountain of youth drying up? Was it in the cards for Zverev to be a threat at Wimbledon? His record thus far in Grand Slams was abysmal and he followed up the biggest win of his career in Rome by losing in the first round in Paris to the 33-year-old Fernando Verdasco. So probably not. The grass court season weighs heavy on the imagination of the tennis lover, but it's a blip on the circuit. The middle of June to the middle of July, three concurrent pairs of 250s and a 500-level tournament, Sir Hotto Jinbosch, and Stuttgart, 
Hall and Queen's Club in London, then Eastbourne and Italia, all serving as summer warm-ups for Wimbledon. Most players tend to play two tournaments in the grass court season, one of those six grass warm-ups, and then the big one, Wimbledon. Some of the Americans and big servers tack on a third by signing up for the one grass court tournament after Wimbledon, the Hall of Fame ceremonial tournament in Newport, Rhode Island. All of this is to say that Wimbledon is a tournament that sneaks up on you. Unlike the French and US Opens, there aren't a bevy of big, similarly surfaced tournaments leading up to it. In the past 20 years, only seven men have won it. To put this in proper perspective, despite Nadal having won 10 titles, now 12, 10 titles in Paris, 10 men have won the French Open in the past 20 years. So who was the favorite coming into Wimbledon? Federer was just starting to play again. And besides, how could he keep up that pace? Remember in 2017, he came back and he'd won the Australian Open, then he went and he won Indian Wells, and then he went and won the Miami Open. Then he took the rest of the clay court season off. Was it then the top seeded, still top ranked and defending Murray, who had thus far been struggling all year to find his best form? Was it Djokovic, who had just won the warm up in Eastbourne and was returning to the site where his 2016 season went from glorious to ungainly and mysteriously fell off the hinges? That Wimbledon was the strangest I'd ever seen and the most important one in my life. I remember thinking how strange it was to be listening to match commentary in English. It had been so, so long, and it made the game feel like it was being played in a different dimension. I lived in a Wimbledon haze. Every match seemed like a green thought in a green shade, and I couldn't walk or feel my leg. I spent Wimbledon 2016 alone in New York, living on a sofa. My left leg was a lamppost. It was wrapped in a soft cast and numerous spools of gauze in order to protect the threads and staples holding together the frayed halves of my Achilles tendon, which had snapped and left both my leg and my summer dead. They say that when you tear your Achilles, it feels like you've been shot in the back of the leg or stabbed by a knife. But it wasn't like that. I was playing basketball, the wrong sport, at the wrong time. And it just went. Simple as that. It was more as though the tendon were a Venetian blind being opened quickly, harshly, the way you do it when you want to wake someone up. I'd never really been injured before. I asked my surgeon if I could have done anything to prevent it. He said, be younger. <laughs> I'm only 41, I said. Exactly, he said. <laughs> I sighed. The 2016 Wimbledon Championships started the day before I went under the knife. I remember watching the American Sam Querrey beat the Czech Lucas Rosol in an absolute thriller, 12-10 in the fifth, and thinking he couldn't ask for more excitement at Wimbledon than that. Of course, he was destined to defeat Djokovic in the third round over three days and snap the Serbs' remarkable 30-match Grand Slam winning streak. Along with every other match at that Wimbledon, I watched both of those Querrey matches thrice in their entirety. I had nowhere to go and nowhere of getting there. So I lived in a stasis on the sofa with Wimbledon on live and Wimbledon on replay, day into night and night into day with an endless glass of lemonade, four pillows to prop up my leg and a bottomless prescription of oxycodone with instructions to take a dose every few hours or, you know, simply when it felt like some pain was on the way. Admittedly, this is a very messed up way to watch Wimbledon. <laughs> Nevertheless, that's how I took it all in. So the tense Serena Kerber women's final, 
Federer's fall literally and figuratively in the men's semis. Murray making the most of his chance to consolidate his status with a second title and the beginning of Djokovic's strange wane. I watched them all three times. There was a reconnection with a part of me I didn't know I had lost. I used to watch tennis all the time, just without the devastating injury, abject loneliness, and highly addictive painkillers. I used to get up at all kinds of absurd hours for matches and then record them on VHS and then record over those when I didn't have any more VHS tapes. I used to hit tennis balls against the handball wall, against the metal gate, simply into the distance, whatever it would take to have a racket in my hand. Tennis was the one sport my parents and I would watch together. My father would actually suggest this. Hey, Agassi Edberg's about to start, let's watch it which I'd forgotten. I'd forgotten he used to do this. I had forgotten it all. I don't know how or why, but tennis slowly became a private joy. I kept watching, but by myself. I stopped playing. I never competed. I'm not very competitive. Now I spend hours hitting with my friends. When we play points, we rarely keep score. That's actually not true now. We've, we're playing sets and all this. And, but I'm not very competitive. At some point, that private joy became something I wanted to share again. And so when my leg was good enough to handle the strain, I started to play again. And even before that, I knew I wanted to write it out. Have an experience with words, which is the best and most genuine way I can think of sharing. Wimbledon was at the middle of all of this. I smelled the grass, and I saw on the flat screen thousands of shades of green. Regardless of the outcome, Wimbledon 2017 was already different. Not only had tennis done something strange, both changed by going forward and changed by going back, so had I back in the mountains, not far from towns with names like La Noy de Gaia, Mas Lorenz, Salamo, and Tamarit, where all the vertigo-inducing winding roads lead downhill, first to Torre de Mbarra, and then to Tarragona. It was a half hour past noon. I looked over the schedule of play to see what matches were set to start the tournament off. Joe Wilfred Sanger versus Cameron Nori. Pierre Hugh Herbert versus Nick Kerrios. Camilla, Camilla Giorgi versus Alizé Cornet. Sam Query versus Thomas Fabiano. Dustin Brown versus Drow Souza. And then I picked one and I bided my time. I'll um, just read a brief snippet as well. Um, oh, about summer, since we're just about there. The Fall and Rise of Roger Federer. The year 2016 ended for Roger Federer on Friday, July 8th. In the fifth set of his semifinal match at Wimbledon, he found himself sprawled out along the service line, face down, ruefully lifting his left leg slightly up and slowly letting it back down, as if to prove to the shocked and silent crowd that he was still alive. Even when he had been ahead in the match against Milos Raonic of Canada, Federer looked weary in the fourth set, he double faulted not once, but twice, ending any hope for a classic. Raonic, six feet, five inches of muscle, topped with a Clark Kent hairdo, is an elite grade version of the typical North American thumper. A thunderous serve, a strong but finicky forehand, and a two-handed backhand right out of an instruction manual. Yet he approaches the net like it's an electric fence. 
Federer had spent his career feasting on this type of player, but not lately. He hadn't won a title all season. He had knee surgery earlier in the year. He skipped the French Open entirely. These days he seemed more gaunt than grassle, more canny than casually assured. Now and then he would see what the other player didn't, couldn't. At such moments, whether half volleys in 2015 or overhead backhand smashes in 2014, his fans rejoiced in their nostalgia. David Foster Wallace's Federer essay would make the rounds on the internet like uncorked champagne. For those of us his age who grew up with Marlon Brando and Superman, Alec Guinness in Star Wars, and Lawrence, of, Lawrence Olivier in Clash of the Titans, it was familiar and fine, though we didn't know why. He slowed, but slowed like a dangerous panther. He staged Scrage suicide missions to the net on his opponent's second serves. His game, a sexy hybrid of tennis in black and white, tennis in standard definition, and tennis in 3D, looked good in defeat. Other players grunted, lunged, sprinted into swinging splits, found the worn patch on a grass surface to buckle over, the grizzle slicked white line to slip on, but not Federer. In his tennis dotage, he was like a Fabergé egg spinning on a tabletop because it could. And then at Wimbledon, he fell. And he didn't just fall, he looked like your uncle doing the robot and having it all go wrong. <laughs> if you saw that match live, you knew then that it was over. Except it wasn't. He started off the 2017 season ranked 17th in the world. Since then, he'd won 31 matches and lost two. He skipped Paris again this year, not because of injury, but because he could afford to. Clay wears on the body. And besides, why let Rafa Nadal take your measure on his sovereign surface? Instead, Federer took time off and waited for Wimbledon, like Christmas morning. By the time he got there, he was seated fourth. He looked sharp, dangerous, healthy, his game kaleidoscopic. At the start of week two, Djokovic, the second seed, withdrew with an injured arm. Nadal lost to 34-year-old Gil Muller, and the defending champion, Andy Murray, succumbed in the quarters to American Sam Querrey and a bad hip. Suddenly, Federer's 2017 Wimbledon became something else entirely. It became a revenge tour. Federer cruised to the quarterfinals, where he faced Raonic again. Raonic dug in, threw everything he had at Federer, and still lost in straight sets. In the semifinal, Federer faced the player who had knocked him out of the 2010 Wimbledon quarterfinal, Thomas Burdich. This time, Federer gut-checked him to a duck season, duck season, rabbit season tune of 7-6, 7-4 in the tiebreak, 7-6, 7-4 in the tiebreak, 6-4. After the match, Burdich was asked if the 2017 version of Federer was better than the 2010, to which he replied, quote, there is no way to prove this if we can measure it, if he's better or not. He's playing just too good, close quote. In the final, Federer again faced Cilic, who had beaten him at the 2014 US Open. He went the entire tournament without losing a single set. Cilic wept after the second set, realizing that the foot blister he carried over from the semifinal hadn't magically healed. Blister or no, he had no clear path to attacking Federer, and Federer knew it. The pinprick-sized hole in Federer's game, the ones that Nadal and Djokovic learned to pry open, seemed gone now. But that's not to say Federer healed both his body and his game. He seemed to have healed his body and changed his game. And I'll close with this. Tennis is a kinetic and rather lonely kind of problem solving. How do you solve for Federer? Serve as though your life depends on it. Push him back with high balls to his backhand. Make him not only play, but also think defensively. And if any of those happen to work, floor it and don't look back. 
But he pushes back as hard now as he ever has. And when he gets a second serve to his backhand, he hits the backhand with top spin and space resolutely from the baseline, exclusively from the baseline, as though he's been told the world was flat and ended there. So much so that any ball that bounces at the baseline, the type of ball that even a professional would sensibly take a few steps back to hit at knee level, he plays as a difficult half volley that he makes look easy. To hit these with intention, in rhythm, again and again against top professionals should be practically unthinkable. And yet they have become typical rally strokes in his game. Every point is about finding the first strike as soon as possible. He takes no time between serves. Rather strangely, at his age, he has sped things up while making the court smaller. It is his younger opponents, a chagrined Chilich, but the latest, who seem starved for time and space. The following day after Federer won Wimbledon, Monday, July 17th, 2017, a 16-year-old boy will appear before a judge in Stratford Youth Court, deep inside an angular beige and burnt sienna building squeezed onto a curving East London city block. He is facing 15 charges, one count of possession of an item to discharge a noxious substance, one count of grievous bodily harm with intent, five counts of attempted grievous bodily harm with intent, three counts of robbery, four counts of attempted robbery, and one count of handling stolen goods. He has been accused of speeding, of spending this past Thursday evening throwing acid onto food delivery men and making off or trying to make off with their vehicles as the victims screamed in agony, unsure of what had just happened to them. Why? or what to do. Five times in little over an hour, these attacks happened. Hackney, Islington, Stoke, Newington, neighborhoods in North East London, the other side of the Thames from Wimbledon, where the royal box is now empty. The dirt patches are being resodded, and we were all regally entertained. Thank you very much. Oh, great. I'm happy to take a couple of questions, um, one or two, two or three, if anyone has any. Hi. Okay, um, so the What's your name? Alex. Hey, Alex. Uh, the first section you read makes it um, evident that you're like a fan of tennis and uh, well with the players. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you're a writer. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Well, you know, it's funny because, um, you know, I wrote this from a point of, of injury. So there's a way in which I guess they were blending, but also my game and body were changing because um, I was hobbled. But in the sense that I, tennis is a language. When you watch people playing tennis, they're having a conversation. I actually call exchanges conversations. So there are ways in which, right? I mean, if I see that you don't have a good backhand and I'm hitting it to your backhand, I'm telling you something. Right? It's a language that you either figure out or you're toast. And that's what I actually love about tennis, that we're, we're talking. When Serena hits a good shot and says, come on, she's not talking to herself. Right? She's trying to scare the bejesus out of the person on the other side of the net. Um, so there's a way in which I think um, inherently, yeah, I've always thought of those as, a, um, as something that's melded into one. But also, um, you know, this is a tennis odyssey, and my, uh, my dear friend Teju Cole, um, he told me about this book. He said, you know, Rowan, you're kind of hoodwinking everybody because you say it's a tennis odyssey, but it's really the Iliad. It's about, it's about, it's lots of people get done over, right? <laughs> As everybody's trying to, you know, attain something. Um, and that I am, if anyone, Philoctetes with my injured leg trying to make sense of it all. But yeah, you know, tennis, I think, more than any sport that I can think of, maybe baseball, but is a, is a, is a sport of, of language and stories. And this is, Dick, you're so on, on the money with the way that you think about the book. If you read this book, you'll find that the stories build 
Often if we just kind of like watch one tournament, we lose the fact that if, I played, if I'm playing Dick now in Stuttgart and we played in Monte Carlo and we played in Brisbane, there's this kind of accumulation of what we were up to. So that one match that you might see is actually carries the residue of all these past conversations, which is the same thing with literary tradition as well, right? When you read Milton, you're reading Virgil. When you read um, uh, Lowell, uh, you're reading a lot of Cleanth Brooks and also a lot of Homer and things like that, right? So it's, I'm very interested in how increment happens. And so this is a study of a year in that sense. Sure. I could take one more question, you're saying? I could take one more if there's another question. No? Great. Yeah. What's your name? Dick. Hey, Dick. Uh, you know, it's a sort of a famous uh, sort of predecessor to you. No, no, pressure makes diamonds. You know, I'm always, you should always be grateful for any great work that comes. I mean, honestly, you know, you'll ask some of the writers here, like, who are your influences? What do you admire? And they'll tell you, but they'll be lying to you to an extent because there's a level of envy that comes past admiration, right? Um, and, but I also think that, that that's healthy, right? Um, but also, I found myself thinking a lot more of John McPhee's great book, Levels of the Game. Um, that for me is the, the book that I was um, aspiring to and kind of carried in my mind. Uh, that's about the 68 U.S. Open final between Arthur Ashe and Carl Grabner um, and his great, great storytelling. And I'm honored to have the same publisher for us, Grouse and Giroux, and um, consider it, like you were asking about, uh, Alex, a conversation as well, a conversation with David Foster Wallace, a conversation with um, John McPhee, a conversation with my great colleague and friend, Louisa Thomas, to whom I dedicated this book and who I admire endlessly, um, and John Wertheim and all of the great tennis writers, I'm just grateful for. Um, sports at its worst can make us mindless, right? And tribal, and I'm really grateful for moments that give us an opportunity to breathe and think about kind of community and all of the ligatures and ways that it brings us together and makes us better. So thank you very much, folks, appreciate it. <laughs>